In the late 80s, the sun set on the Dallas Cowboys empire, and critics predicted it might never rise again. But the Cowboys proved that Rome could be rebuilt in a day, and Dallas soared to heights that only they could have foreseen. You play in games to find out who are the contenders and who are the pretenders. Hey, dominate the line of scrimmage. Let's have a hell of a game. Win. One, two, three, win. Their versatile and punishing defense was the NFL's best. They were never out hustled or out muscled, out fought or out fought. First and 10, Dallas at the 24, Aikman. Deep ball, looking for Harper on the goal line. Oh, nice catch! Touchdown, Cowboys! The 1992 Cowboys won the most games in their storied history. And by season's end, the youngest team in the NFL was also its best. In Super Bowl 27, the remarkable Cowboys capped off their Cinderella season by destroying the Buffalo Bills and winning their third world championship. It was a season where dreams became harmonious with destiny, a season where the Dallas Cowboys exhausted every adjective and superlative. There was only one thing left to say. Super Bowl champions last year. This year, it's our turn. Third and ten, and Aikman straight drop looking left. Deep ball for Harper to the end zone. It's caught. Cowboys. It couldn't have been thrown any better. They're going to rush the Kelly Goodburn punt, and they block it in the end zone. Victory over the world champion Redskins foreshadowed the immense possibilities of this team. There's a block, 30, there's a block, 40, there goes Kelvin Martin. This one's going 79 yards. Kelvin Martin, touchdown, Dallas Cowboys. What a great, great run by Kelvin Martin. It's all, look at you. What did I say? I said we beat the Redskins, but let me tell you something. And just like I said last week, what I tell you last week, Last week, I went, last week, I said, you know, that once you show up on Wednesday, we don't want to hear another word about Washington. Enjoy the thing tonight, but we don't want another thing about Washington. All I want to hear about Wednesday is the New York Giants. In New York, the Cowboys got off on the right foot. Big rush, and they blocked the punt. Robert Williams at the four, rolls to the goal line. Touchdown, Cowboys. Victory in week two was primed by a unit that was special all season. Make the play. Run your ass off. We're kicking middle. Kick in the middle. Run it. Run it. Make a play. Let's go, Ben. Cowboys special teamers hit so hard and so often that it was unsafe even for spectators. But rookie kicker Lynn Elliott and punter Mike Saxon learned that the real fun was watching the NFL's second leading return specialist, Kelvin Martin. Runs up under it at the 26, left at the 30, 35 and a big hole. The 50, the kicker to beat. He's gonna tie Bob Hayes, team record. Touchdown, Kelvin Martin, 74 yards. While the special teams created the early season rhythms, the offense picked up the beat against the Cardinals. And Aikman, play fake, is going to throw. Good protection, throws the ball out. Nice catch, Irvin on the left side, right escaping at the 25. Down to the 40 with a block. Turns right and left again at the 40. And Irvin to the 25. And Irvin gets a block from Novacek to the 5. And Michael Irvin goes 87 yards. Three straight victories were beautifully choreographed, but the season took its first wrong steps against the undefeated Eagles. 
Defeated but not intimidated, the Cowboys knew that soon there would be a payback. Right back here. We're going to be fine. We'll get it right back. Victory over the Seahawks began a sweep of the AFC West. Hit by Haley, throws it, tipped, and intercepted by Horton at the 15 to the 10, and Ray Horton runs it in for the Cowboys touchdown. All day, baby. We covered them all day, baby. The Cowboys defeated the Chiefs for their fifth win in six games. And their faithful and rabid fans were a big part of every victory. We had those fans behind us there in Texas Stadium. Uh, it's like a bull ring. Everybody's sitting right out on the field. And when they can get involved in the game, when our players can hear their emotion, uh, it can make it happen and be something very special. Special was the pep rally at Texas Stadium that attracted 75,000 cowboy fanatics. Cowboy fever infected people of all ages, from all places. There was no generation gap for everybody to love the Cowboys. Throughout the country, the Cowboys were once again America's team. Come on now, we're here! Just to hear people talk about America's team, uh, at this point, understanding where we came from, uh, it's a really gratifying feeling. Everywhere the Cowboys went, their fans were sure to follow. And as they ran victory laps away from home, road games began to look as friendly and homey as Texas Stadium. At Sun Devil Stadium in Phoenix, a record crowd came to root for the Cowboys, and a tidal wave of support broke across the shores of the NFL. We went to L.A., and we had like almost 90,000 people and I know 40,000 that was screaming for us. It's what it feels like to be on top, be America's team. I can't believe it. Look at all that blue up there. Not moving either. Turn it up. Good job. Hey, guys, the pressure off the corner's outstanding. Keep fighting them inside, guys. The Cowboys turned the silver and black, black and blue, and captured win number six. at the Raiders' 33-yard line. Wing left, A.G.'s the wing, Aikman back to throw. Good pickup of the blitz by Giesick. Deep ball to the middle. Nice pass, and it's caught at the 30. And down to the 20-yard line is Alvin Harper again. Aikman, handoff. Smith, big hole on the right side. Over check, key block. Touchdown, Evan Smith. This is a very good offensive team. Aikman hands it to Smith. Gaping hole on the left. He's going to score to the 10. Emmett Smith strolls in. The offensive line blew it open. And Emmett Smith looked like an agent at Spago with about four starlets in the room. Gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> the 28 to 13 victory was their third straight over an AFC Western opponent. to come in here and, and win in front of 91,000. Uh, uh, that says something for our football team. Our, our guys are young, but they're growing up in a hurry. Maybe we got used to playing in Los Angeles today. We'll see. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Let's get it going. This is Randall. He's going to be Eagle Soup today. Going to be a long day for the Eagles. Cowboys defense. Woo! The offensive line of Mark Stepnoski, John Giesick, Nate Newton, Mark Tuane, and Eric Williams tamed the fierce Eagles defense and turned blind alleys into expressways for Emmett Smith. And hands it to Smith. Big hole right 
right at the 15, and evades a man at the 20, and breaks loose at the 30, and heads right to midfield, and a foot race to the 40-yard line of the Philadelphia Eagles. And the leading rusher in the NFC takes over the offensive one. Bateman back to throw, block from Smith, throws it right, Johnson caught it at the 10. Oh, 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 touchdown, Moose! Touchdown, Moose! Oh, it's a Moose down! Martin motion right on first down. Pass over the middle, Martin. Oh, nice cut back. Oh, right to the, the 10. To the 5 with a block. Oh, oh, right out. Touchdown, Kelvin Martin. Oh, what a play. Oh, man, what a run by Kelvin Martin. Our offense, uh, they were going strong and really wore down Philadelphia's defense. I think the biggest thing about the Philadelphia game was that uh, the defense played so well. The best defense in the NFL belonged to the Cowboys. Short jab. Using every player in every conceivable combination, the defense became a relentless tackling machine. <laughs> Up front came Maryland, Casillas, Lett, Jeffcoat, Jones, Tolbert, and Haley. Quarterbacks were attacked from all positions and all angles. The result was 48 sacks by a defense that made it almost impossible to convert third downs into first downs. Behind the front line came Norton, Jones, Smith, Miles, and Edwards. Washington, Gant, Horton, Holt, Brown, Everett, Woodson, and Smith patrolled the deep defense. The Cowboys' goal was creating turnovers and turning them into touchdowns. And Russell Maryland grabs the fumble in midair and runs it in for the touchdown. Russell Maryland with his first... Number one defense in the league. <laughs> Number one defense. defense in the league. Dallas Cowboy defense, unconscious. In the final eight games, the Cowboys were a team whose second win blew gale force. They huffed and puffed and blew away six of eight opponents by scores that had to be seen to be believed. The true test of the character of this team came in Denver, where Troy Aikman generaled his team to a thrilling comeback victory. In 1992, Aikman was a dreamboat of a hero. But it was in the fury of the past pocket that he stood the tallest and the toughest. Finally injury-free, Aikman threw for almost 3,500 yards and 23 touchdowns. The Cowboy passing attack featured the pinpoint passing of Aikman to a gifted core of receivers. He throws it to Novacek, 15, right to the 10, to the 5, over the block. Inside the red zone, the all-pro tight end and elusive Kelvin Martin created scores and limited spaces. On the flanks, the spectacular was the province of Alvin Harper and all-pro Michael Irvin. Got plenty of time. Deep ball left side. Oh, Michael Irvin can catch. He can run. He can oh. do it. <laughs> Both the playmaker and Harper turned simple patterns into sublime touchdowns. Now to the 10 he'll score. What a play by Alvin Harper. What a great play. A few great plays by a few good men were needed in Mile High Stadium as the Cowboys trailed by three points with just minutes to play. Ignoring chilling temperatures and a heated environment, this cool, calm, and collected young team marched 78 yards to victory. field they come in the fourth quarter this incidentally is the seventh time if they hang on to win that Aikman has brought the Cowboys to behind the comeback also came on the heels of pro football's leading rusher 
with each yard he travels. Emmett Smith inches closer to the Hall of Fame, and in 1992, he won the NFL rushing title for the second year in a row. Number 22 sacrificed life and limb for six points, and this daredevil approach produced 19 touchdowns. There's a handoff, Smith up the middle, breaks a tackle. Emmett Smith breaking a beheading tackle, punches it in. Touchdown. While Emmett got down and dirty, he also left defenders in his dust. Motion to the right, Aikman. Handoff, Smith, big hole of right tackle to the 40, and he's gone. Emmett Smith taking it all away. Got a seam, got the lane, got 68 yards. This one's over. It was over and out when Smith navigated in an open field. His ability to dominate a football game was never more evident than in the last two games of the season. Aikman handoff, Smith coming right. Trying to outrun the coverage, makes a cut. Gets it, oh, he's still going. Oh, my God. He's going to score. He's got the five. It's a touchdown. Emmett Smith. And it's absolutely ridiculous. It should never have happened, but Emmett Smith does the impossible, this time from 29 yards out. Oh, this is incredible. This is one of the very best. Let's look from the Bears on first down. Cowboys at the 32. Aikman handoff. Smith coming left. He's got the 25. He's got the 20. He's got the 10. He's got the touchdown. And he's got the NFL rushing championship for the second year in a row. Defeats of the Falcons and Bears gave the NFC Eastern Titleist 13 victories and set up the dramatic final stages of the championship chase. The Cowboys beat up the Eagles physically, then outwitted them strategically by isolating their tall receivers on five foot seven inch Eagle cornerback Mark McMillan, number 29. Proving without a doubt who owned the iron fist in football's best division, the Cowboys pounded out a convincing 34 to 10 victory. In Candlestick Park, the Cowboys met the team considered the NFL's best and vividly demonstrated that next year's champions had arrived a year early. Get tired, all right. Get up! Sit up! Johnston got the block, and Smith will easily stroll in. Touchdown, Cowboys. Block right, Aikman back. He's pressured. He throws it out. Smith's there. He's got the first down coming right to five. Urban's block puts it in. Emmett Smith carries it in. Another third down conversion, and it's touchdown, Dallas. The Cowboys' glorious past met its glorious present late in the fourth quarter. 
leading 24 to 20 with four minutes to play. Conventional wisdom dictated a conservative play call by the Cowboys. The Cowboys come out for the biggest drive in probably 12 years. Aikman is gonna throw, deep slant, caught, 35. Harper's breaking away, Harper's got midfield. <laughs> Harper's got the 20, Harper's got the 10 yard line. Wow. What a play. <laughs> My oh, goodness, what a play. Crowd is really into it. Aikman, a straight drop, good protection. Over the middle, it's caught by Kelvin Martin at the two. Touchdown, touchdown, Cowboys. This team's going to Pasadena. NFC champions, folks. From 1-15 in 89 to the Super Bowl four years. That's unbelievable. An unbelievable story. NFC championship, baby. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Everybody, you did for the hell of a job. And the only thing else I got to say is, how about them Cowboys? Yeah! Sunny California provided a perfectly lit backdrop for a Hollywood ending to the dream season of the Dallas Cowboys and their leading man. Aikman with a straight drop to throw again. Going for the end zone. Novacek at the two. Takes it in. Touchdown, Cowboy. Pro bowler to pro bowler. Kelly's going to throw. Here's Haley. Hit him and picked off in the air. Jimmy Jones intercepts and rolls in for a touchdown. And the turnover. Troy Aikman, the game's most valuable player, completed 22 of 30 passes and threw for four touchdowns, including two that Michael Irvin punctuated in breathtaking fashion. of light that guided this season became the bright glow of ultimate victory. It enveloped the stadium and this team that played almost a perfect game. A cowboy steamroller rolled up and down the Rose Bowl. Emmett Smith and the cowboy offense flattened everything in sight while the defense squashed the Bills by creating nine takeaways and converting two of them into touchdowns. Super Bowl 27 marked the culmination of a startling turnaround. The rebuilding, which began in 1989 as a marathon, ended in a sprint. The astonishing 52 to 17 triumph was a testament to a group of talented and dedicated players, a visionary owner, and a driven and bold head coach. Jimmy Johnson's taking his team from the absolute worst to the absolute best in four years. The Cowboys are back on top of the mountain now. They were there in the 70s, fell off in the 80s. They're back on top. Wow, what a ride it's been. And Dallas, your Cowboys are the champions. How about them Cowboys? Yeah! Hi, I'm Steve Sable. The 1992 Dallas Cowboys became the best team in pro football by winning the league's toughest division and then dominating the postseason with a unique style that blended both power and precision. In four short seasons, the Cowboys had gone from pro football's worst team to its best. This swift rise has prompted many experts to use the dreaded D word, dynasty. But all the pieces seem to be in place in Dallas for a run to true greatness, a glory run like the Steelers had in the 70s or the 49ers in the 80s. They're young, they're talented, 
and led by the aggressive management of Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson. A style of leadership that will continue to take the risks and the calculated gambles in the offseason that will ensure that the Dallas Cowboys will once again be at or near the summit of pro football in 1993. There was nothing about the 1992 season that was messed up. The Cowboys followed a plan that was as rigid as Jimmy Johnson's normal hairstyle. Repeating will be difficult, but the Cowboys will be daring, not timid in the offseason. Our fans have maybe gotten used to a very aggressive approach to uh, how we build a football team. Uh, that's the only way to go as far as I'm concerned. We will continue to be very aggressive. We'll continue to take risks. And uh, we've done that. It's worked well for us so far. That's our style, and that's the way we'll go in the future. Much of this future will evolve in summer camp when the management team of Jones and Johnson hope to plug in young defensive players like number 47 cornerback Clayton Holmes, safety Darren Woodson, and defensive end and tackle Chad Hennings. The last training camp produced number 55 Robert Jones, a middle linebacker who started and starred in his rookie season. Number 94 Charles Haley has signed a new contract and will be a Dallas Cowboy for the next several seasons. The 93 season will see this pillager of pass pockets overwhelm offensive tackles and quarterbacks. When defenses overcompensate for the presence of Haley, it allows young and upcoming defensive linemen to get in their licks. The Cowboy defense in 93 will feature an aggressive gang tackling style of play. Standing out in this swarming mass of men will be number 92, Tony Tolbert, Russell Maryland, Jimmy Jones, and that man mountain, Leon Lett, number 78, a player on the verge of certain stardom. While the defense made monumental strides last year and will again in 93, Jimmy Johnson will strive for improvement in all areas of the football team. I really think with any football team that you make improvement, I, I think you look at uh, the overall team and, and see areas where you can improve, whether it be with areas of your special teams or, or certain parts of your offense and defense. And the other thing is you try to upgrade your personnel uh, every opportunity that you have. The offensive line is a unit where the Cowboys hope to improve their depth with some young players. This was also a unit that turned into a powerful strength for the Cowboys last season. Even the fiercest pass rushers will be turned away next year, as the offensive line hopes to allow even less sacks than the 23 they gave up in 1992. The line's ability to dominate defensive linemen will not only increase point production, it will keep all-pro quarterback Troy Aikman injury-free for the second straight season. We, we got enough talent on this team that when we get inside the 20-yard line, we, we need to get inside the end zone. And, and those, that's, the, that's the difference, I think, between championship teams and great teams. You get a lot of great teams that gets inside the 20, gets inside the 20 a lot, but they come away with those field goals. But those championship teams, they come away with touchdowns, and that's what we gotta do. We gotta come away with touchdowns. Touchdowns, whether they are in the red zone or long distance, will be the province of Emmett Smith, who will once again hope to score the most six pointers in the league. The blocks of fullback Darrell Johnston have often provided the springboard for the brilliance of Smith. In 1993, Johnston, a clutch receiver, will probably have to handle a little more of the rushing load, an area that the Cowboys may address with a rookie from the draft. But no matter what the manpower situation is, 
the man will still be Emmett Smith. The cowboy passing attack will need no revamping either, just a little tweaking here and there. With all pros at almost every position, the Cowboys, using the controlled passing game of Norv Turner, will almost certainly improve on the gaudy statistics of last season. Number 80, Alvin Harper has the skills to develop into a superstar, while the NFL's best tight end will remain Jay Novacek, number 84. And one of the NFL's greatest players in the clutch will again be number 88, Michael Irvin, the playmaker. Inserted into this explosive mix will be Jimmy Smith, who lost almost all of 92 to injury. So the preview for 1993 is a rosy one for this talented team. They are young. They will be deeper and hopefully hungry for a run at a second straight world championship. While the Cowboys of the 90s are once again America's team, they're clearly different from the original version of the 1970s. That team was laid back and unemotional and typified by one of its greatest players, defensive tackle Bob Lilly. He was the Cowboys' first number one draft pick, a gentle giant from Texas Christian University who is as country as chewing tobacco and armadillo boots. He was nicknamed Mr. Cowboy, and over the course of a 14-year career, he was both an immovable object and an irresistible force. Number 74 made All-Pro 11 times by demonstrating that single-minded determination will defeat a double team almost every time. Lilly retired in 1974 and became the first player to be inducted into both the Cowboys' Ring of Honor and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I don't know if any of you would ever remember in Dallas there was an old Burnett Park. Anyway, they condemned it. They had rats about this long. And we had, the first year I was with the Cowboys, we had to hang up our uniforms with coat hangers or anything leather, like shoes, shoulder pads, or the helmets with the inserts. They would eat it up during the night. You would come back and your shoes and all that would just be destroyed. And that was back in the days when we had to buy our own shoes. <laughs> Bob Lilly and the infant Dallas Cowboys walked barefoot on bumpy paths that offered few glimpses of the glory roads that both were destined to travel. This country boy from Throckmorton, Texas, revolutionized the position of defensive tackle with a stunning combination of speed and strength. Strength formed not by weights and pulleys, but farm work. Lily was the boy at the county fair who wrestles the bear and wins. I think the most unusual thing about Bob Lilly was if you put 50 people in a room, you know, and had them stripped down to where they just had the shorts on, he would be the last guy you would pick. And, you know, he just didn't have the, the physique that you thought a football player had, no muscle definition whatsoever. He didn't epitomize the professional athlete, in my opinion, because he was kind of soft. It wasn't hard as a brick, you know, it's kind of soft. And that's what he played, kind of soft. He didn't really kill anybody, but he, he made the plays, always made the plays. It's not how hard you hit, you know, but how good you tackle. In 12 years that I played against Lily, I, I really don't remember having even a decent game against him. He'd grab you and pull you, and he had tremendous quickness and tremendous reach and, and strength. Bob Lilly was just a great football player, and we never could get him to line up on sides. We always thought he lined up off sides, and, complained to the officials and nothing happened. So Cornelius Johnson one night was nauseated and uh, he just regurgitated on Lily's hands and that way we got him off the ball. In fact, he stood up and stood well back so that we could snap the ball and run the play of our choice. 
Where Lily did stand was at the forefront as the Cowboys gained power and prestige. He was a man among boys, the unstoppable, unblockable force of the doomsday defense. Opponents could neither contain him with a single player, nor run away from him. So they afforded Lily the ultimate tribute. He was a guy that if they double teamed him, he beat him, if they triple teamed him. And very few people I've ever played with, I've never seen many people triple team. He's the only player I've, I've ever been associated with when we watch films on Monday that the other, his peers, including myself, would be there in awe and actually would ooh and awe during the film watching him do the things he could do. I remember seeing the guard pull and the center tried to cut him off. When the guard pulls, the center tries to make the block on Lily. And Lily jumped over the center, weighing 260 pounds. Well, I just was in awe of that and never, and never forgot that. That he had quick feet. Uh, nobody could get into him. Nobody could block him. He would shiver him. The guards would try to get into him, and he would have him and control him. He'd toss him aside. You know, he would take his hand and, and hit his eye. I mean, hit his eye, and he wouldn't blink. And that takes a lot of work. And I used to ask him, you know, Bob, what are you doing? I noticed that when you shut your eyes, like if, if you're on the line, you have a tendency a lot of times when the contact is made to blink your eyes. And so I used to sit in the meeting rooms all the time, and I'd go like this, and I'd just do, hit my eyeballs even. Oh, yeah, he used to, and I thought he was nuts, you know. Him and Andrew and, and all them guys would be sitting there, and they'd be hitting it. I said, what in the heck? You know, they've gone schizo on us, you know. When I was playing up there, I would concentrate on the man across from me so much that I could see his whiskers. I would see every little whisker in his face. I would watch the ball over here, and the minute it was snapped, I would go, and I would hit this guy, but never blink my eyes so I could see which side he was trying to get on. Lily left foes bent but not bloodied, a trait many viewed as a curse, not a compliment. Well, here was this big guy, and he, and he was quiet. He was just kind of gentle because he was so quick and, and fast, and he was running over people, taking on two blockers and, and beating them, and yet he wasn't, he wasn't really that mean. I mean, that just wasn't my style. I don't know whether it's, you know, was the way I was brought up or whether it was just that I just wasn't a very mean person, you know, and I, it, it was something I just couldn't do if I wasn't that way. Bob Lilly was more like a Bengal tiger, that he didn't really have to confront people and beat them up. He could leap over them or go around them or be smarter than they were and still make the play. Lily's style was clean and pure, without a trace of nastiness. But when this cowboy was bushwhacked, he meted out frontier justice. We played him in an exhibition game in Texas Stadium. And he was coming off the guard, and I just unloaded with the best shot I had, probably the only good shot I had in 12 years against him. I hit him right in the sternum, you know, came up and, and got him in the chin. And he stepped back and he slugged me. I looked at him and I said, Bob, I don't believe he did that. I mean, it was... It was like he did something that uh, was totally out of character for him. Lily and the Cowboys were a sucker punched with the nickname Next Year's Champions. Despite playing brilliantly in consecutive title game losses to the Packers and in a bitter defeat to the Colts in Super Bowl V, Lily was lumped in with a team called Heartless and Gutless. Dallas Cowboys, bridesmaids of the NFL. That was a tag that we heard everywhere we went. It was ever paper bridesmaids. And it's a, that's a tag that a, a pro football player just doesn't like. I think when we won the Super Bowl of beating Miami, that that was like somebody lifted off a 100-pound weight off all of us. The Dolphins sank under his weight in Super Bowl VI, as did the myth that the Cowboys were chokers. He was the team's oldest player and perhaps more than anyone else understood and celebrated the significance of this victory. Bob Lilly was a gifted athlete. He was a player that was uh, so superior to the people around him. The guy had strength, he had quickness. It took two or three guys to block him. The best player I ever coached. 
In 1974, Bob Lilly retired. He was the Cowboys' first number one draft pick, their first All-Pro, their first inductee into the Ring of Honor, and their first Hall of Famer. Mr. Cowboy had traveled the glory road from Throckmorton, Texas to Canton, Ohio.